So, thanks for having me talk about here uh, Sparge on the area, disputive uh, implications of entrepreneurial risk. I uh, joined with uh, Rob Townsend. So, entrepreneurship has attracted a lot of attention from, especially from the development literature for, for a while now. Uh, and one of the key facts uh, found is the fact that returns are typically large for uh, small entrepreneurs in developing countries. Usually, these returns are heterogeneous. Uh, and somehow friction seemed to prevent uh, uh, these businesses to grow. So despite the uh, high, high returns, uh, this, uh, these agents don't simply grow out of, the, of poverty uh, in spite of these high returns. And the typical interpretation of this fact is the, uh, the idea of boring constraints. So the, you have a project that has high returns, but you don't have the resources to invest in it. If you could, uh, you would. Uh, you just don't do it because you, uh, you have no way to getting funds, right? So this particular interpretation of this, uh, this fact, uh, motivated in particular like this uh, large expansion in, in microcredit. And it turns out that the evidence and the fact that this this kind of policy have been uh, uh, more modest than we would expect. Uh, several of these uh, microcredit expansions have been recently evaluated and impact has been uh, were limited, were low take up rates for several of these entrepreneurs. And what we're going to do today is, is to provide and to, to explore a different interpretation of this fact that entrepreneurs have these high returns and the reasons why they, they don't grow. So the reason may be not because agents cannot borrow or this may not be the, the relevant constraint uh, um, for all entrepreneurs, Maybe the reason that uh, these guys have to bear too much risk. So if the business you're investing on is already very risky, if there's a lot of your wealth that's already uh, exposed to this source of risk, giving you more credit, giving you the chance to lever up, be more exposed to the source of risk, it's not going to help you. So like I'm already taking too much risk, so I would want to take up a lot of credit and to be even more exposed to it. So in this case, there's different friction. Uh, this, uh, you can think of this as insurance constraints, instead of borrowing constraints. So it's gets limited how much uh, they're able to diversify uh, the source of risk has been evaluated in some uh, uh, micro studies and have been found uh, uh, some positive impact. What we're going to do today here is try to study the macro implications of this sort of constraints and impact of relaxing them. So I'm trying to uh, evaluate what are the consequences of providing insurances, insurance for these uh, entrepreneurs, both in terms of the aggregate impact and how much like the overall production, overall uh, growth in business uh, would obtain, but also in terms of the distributive impact, so how much of uh, this would affect inequality, how much it would affect the returns for, for the entrepreneur activity. Okay? Uh, and the way that I want to do this is we're going to try to have a framework that is uh, disciplined by what we see uh, in the data. So we're going to work off this uh, uh, database from, from Thailand that has been, uh, uh, been served for like more than 15, year, 15 years now. Uh, and we're going to try to provide a framework that can account for the main facts that observe in the, in the Thai data. And the two things stand out. So one is the fact that um, these uh, businesses are very risky. So the coefficient variation, so the standard deviation over the mean return is around five. So here, like very high uh, risk uh, activities. And more than 90% of the variance is accounted for idiosyncratic risk. So there's a lot of idiosyncratic risk that are in these projects. That by itself doesn't mean that uh, this is a big problem because potentially idiosyncratic risk can be diversified. If you have uh, uh, for insurance, there's going to be uh, actually no impact on returns. So what we find is, uh, is half of the expected returns uh, can roughly be explained by idiosyncratic risk. So this uh, by itself tells us, one, that this there's some kind of imperfect insurance in such that this idiosyncratic risk, even though diversifiable, it still commands a premium in equilibrium. And, and two, that somehow there's some differences in the sharp ratio between aggregate and idiosyncratic risk. 
So in this gonna tell us something about uh, the degree of, of insurance in this economy. So we're gonna try to infer from this, this information on risk and return of these activities or how much actual insurance this uh, agents have access to and, and then try backing out uh, uh, what is this, the, the extent of these frictions, okay? So we're, we're, so we're going to be a little bit more, more precise later. So, but the idea is, on, take the average return on for a given entrepreneur uh, there. So you can attribute the returns basically to a remuneration for holding aggregate risk, and part of it can be remuneration for holding just graphic risk. So imagine that, take the cap and type of logic where each different entrepreneurs may have different betas, but different exposures to aggregate risk, right? So betas, the difference in betas, will explain some of the variation in returns that we observe in entrepreneurs. Some of it will not be explained by difference in betas. So even two entrepreneurs with the same exposure to aggregate risk, they will have different returns. So why are they going to have different returns? Because they may have different exposures to idiosyncratic risk, okay? In this sense, um, you can explain explain part of the returns by aggregate return, aggregate, or an aggregate premium, so a premium for holding aggregate risk, part of it of idiosyncratic premium, so a premium for holding some of this idiosyncratic risk. So the fact that you and I may be permanently different from each other, it's also part of this Not really, actually, there's a third part of the story that I'm not telling you, right? So I'm told, I told you that you can explain returns by a remuneration for holding aggregate risk, the part of the remuneration for holding just syncretic risk, and there, there would be what in finance we call alpha. There's some, something else, right? Something else could be like some like fixed effect on, on your productivity. So you can, can be different, that's because even, the, even though we have the same exposure to aggregate risk, the same exposure to syncretic risk, you know, we may have differences in, in, in our productivity. We're gonna measure that as well, okay? This is the cleaning of that. Yeah. In, in practice, what, what are you thinking in terms of insurance? So we, we didn't come back to that as well. So how do we think in insurance here? So the way that we think about insurance is some kind of, like, kind of informal arrangement. So we're, gonna, we're talking about the context of, of some villages in Thailand. And one thing that we observe is there are some kind of transfers among entrepreneurs. So I have my crop uh, that turns out that this year I have like a bad crop. And uh, not only farmers, but farmers as well. So you can have in the data you, may, you have some activities. So you can sell uh, shrimp. You can may have a plot of land. You may. I think it's about half and a half. No, exactly. Not exclusively farmers, but yeah, probably half and half and a half. Um, and sorry, I was answering your question. <laughs> in practice. Oh, about the, 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 the insurance. So basically, the, the idea is these guys have some kind of like uh, um, informal insurance arrangement. See, uh, take this example of a farmer. If my crop goes bad the one, one year, uh, you may stop up and help me. In the next year, we go. Uh, uh, we do, do the same for you, uh, and actually, we can be able to measure some of this transfer. So, uh, in this survey, the one that the ITS has collected, that uh, gifts and transfers among uh, different members of the village, and you can identify it exactly in periods where uh, your uh, activity goes bad. You tend to receive more of these transfers in a period where uh, your activity goes well. You tend to make so. On this transfer. So that's kind of like when I take when I talk about insurance, I'm not literally talking about like formal insurance, but mostly about this kind of, of informal arrangements. Okay. So and an important aspect of the story so the, uh, is the fact that there's a lot of heterogeneity. So one is we're talking about this difference in the aggregate and just incratic risk, and the second is the fact that there's a lot of variation in how much uh, this uh, individuals invest on their businesses. Right, so especially we, we found that in the data there's a lot of variation over the life cycle. Young entrepreneurs tend to um, invest a larger share of the wealth in 
on the business, it turns out to have like uh, several implications on on the determination of the idiosyncratic risk premium in equilibrium, and also uh, will help us uh, discipline the model. So we're going to try to build a model that's able to account for these aggregate facts, but also to uh, to account for a lot of this heterogeneity observed in the data. Okay. So then this is going to motivate our two main ingredients. So basically, we're going to build uh, a model that has uh, these two features. First, partial insurance for idiosyncratic risk. So you have some aggregate idiosyncratic risk on your business, you're going to be able to ensure uh, this aggregate uh, risk. We're going to assume the ag aggregate outcomes are perfect observable, but there's some uh, imperfect insurance of idiosyncratic risk. Assume that idiosyncratic risk is private information, so there's there are going to be some kind of skin in the game constraint that will limit how much of, of this risk you can diversify or get some insurance from uh, others in the village and how much you have to keep yourself, okay? Uh, another feature of this is gonna be the overlap of generations of uh, finite horizon entrepreneurs. So uh, agents are gonna have uh, finite horizon that are gonna leave for uh, T periods and they have some kind of imperfect altruism, okay? Turns out that um, when you're thinking about the impact of relaxing this insurance constraints, it may affect that have will be uh, on this idiosyncratic risk premium. And that's the composition that I've been talking about before, like half of being explained by idiosyncratic uh, risk premium. This changes when you change this per parameter that controls how much your risk you can diversify, yes. So this partial insurance you talk about, this uh, transfer among these uh, entrepreneurs, how much can I think about as a kind of a form of a bond market among themselves? Uh, a form of what? Like a bond market among themselves. Uh, this is not, so the way that we're going to uh, uh, do this, so they have access to, uh, to the savings instruments, so they have like uh, bonds in there, they have access to aggregate insurance, so they can get rid of the aggregate risk that they want, but there will be a price in that, but have some form of diversifying the idiosyncratic risk, okay? So then, then, but only a fraction of this, so only a fraction of your returns uh, you can pass on to uh, others member, other members of the village. And they like, somehow like, you think about some like, agrarian model, if I only have one market, can choose some kind of... Someone said self, self insurers yeah, yeah. So that's not, not, not going to be like that. So because it's not that you're going to have like a lot of resources and then you have like some bad shock then you're going to self-insure. So it's like every period, as soon as you get some bad shock, uh, someone's going to step up and hold some of that. Okay, you're gonna have access to the bond, so you can do that. Uh, from allocation, it sounds similar to a bond market. If I buy, I borrow more. If I save more. Not much. So yeah, uh, let's get back to that. I want to show you the model. You're gonna see that's that's not gonna look like that. Uh, so we're saying basically, this kind of risk premium is gonna play an important role on this on this story. So it's gonna be related to uh, um, to the Lagrange multiplier on this. Uh, uh, skin in the game constraint, and it's going to shape like the risk-taking decision of, of these entrepreneurs. We're going to be key to understand uh, our patterns of inequality and how wealth are distributed among these different agents, and also the aggregate level of production will also be shaped by by this idiosyncratic risk premium. So thinking about insurance constraints, how like uh, uh, far wide implications for for these economies. Okay. So let me jump uh, uh, into the model. So basically, first we're going to uh, go over uh, the entrepreneur's problem. So first we're going to focus on the problem of a given entrepreneur. Then we're going to discuss uh, what are the implications for uh, savings and risk taking over the life cycle. So we're going to lay out the life cycle problem and show how uh, this life cycle decisions are taken. Then we're going to spend some time talking about uh, testing those life cycle predictions and how does that line up with the evidence for, from the tide data and how we can um, potentially measure some of these uh, 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 initially known observable uh, features like the Lagrange like multiplier on this um, uh, skin of the game constraint. Then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the implications for inequality, the aggregate equilibrium, the determination of, of prices in particular of the idiosyncratic risk premium, and then we're going to do our counterfactual. We're going to do, see what happened when uh, somehow we're able to expand insurance uh, in this village, so how somehow like this uh, scheme the game constraints relaxed. Okay. So time is continuous, so there's a continuous time model. 
entrepreneurs are going to live for T periods. They receive income from labor and from assets, it's going to matter uh, uh, for us. So they have multiple sources of income for each entrepreneur, something that we see in the data as well. They make consumption and investment decisions. Okay? So the entrepreneurs must choose between riskless asset and a risky production activity. The production technology serves to both aggregate and idiosyncratic risks. Uh, the entrepreneurs have access to insurance market, so there's unlimited access to aggregate insurance, but aggregate insurance is costly. So you may pay a premium to get rid of some of the aggregate insurance, uh, and you can buy as much as you want. There's also a market for idiosyncratic insurance, but there's limited access to it. Idiosyncratic insurance is costless, the reason being that the suppliers of this U.S. insurance can perfectly diversify among the different entrepreneurs. So the price in equilibrium is going to be zero, but... Uh, can you put the question at the same time? So, so I'm going to show you the, the equations, like this is like a... No, it works, 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 I'm very down on how to process. You might have a question there when I'm going to talk. I have a related comment. Okay. What? Okay. Okay. Okay, so let me show you the equations then, all right. So let me show you the, the technology and I'll show you the constraint. I want, okay, I can show you the, the constraint here. That's what I was talking about. This, you can buy, so that's basically pretty much what I was talking about, okay? So you can buy aggregate insurance, okay. Is here. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, we can talk here, there's no problem. So, all right. So basically what are you gonna do? So you're gonna choose capital, you're gonna choose uh, aggregate insurance or just incorrect insurance, that's pretty much what you're doing. So choosing capital. So if, if we choose capital, that means they have less on bonds, more on capital, that's the return on capital, okay? You can buy aggregate insurance, so aggregate insurance is going to take out some of your returns and take out take out some of your risk. I'm, I'm a bit confused. Okay. What is the state of this guy? Wealth, portfolio. Yeah. What is? Where is that? That's wealth. That doesn't your net worth. That's your wealth. Okay. That's right. So this is your flow budget constraint. You're subject to aggregate and idiosyncratic risk. You receive some labor income. You consume. That's your portfolio problem. You're choosing how much of capital you're investing. Okay. Then another thing that you can do, you can buy some of aggregate insurance. Okay. So think, but this is going to reduce your return and reduce your risk at some price. You can buy some idiosyncratic insurance. It doesn't affect your expected return, but you're limited. You can. Yeah. That's a, the part is the part that was skipped. So we're going to go back to that. So it's kind of hidden here inside the, the return. You can hire labor. Um, going to come back to that in a sec. Let, just for you to understand the flow budget constraint. So that's pretty much the problem. So you have to choose capital. You have to move, choose aggregate insurance. You have to choose just syncretic insurance. OK? So let me come back to the production technology then. So that's production technology. So pretty standard. You combine uh, capital and labor. You're subject to aggregate risk, okay? So that's aggregate productivity. Everyone's affected by this. Capital accumulation is, <coughs> is affected by idiosyncratic risk, okay? So you may choose your investment rate, okay? So how much capital is gonna grow on average, but how much effectively you're gonna grow depends on, on this diversification of this idiosyncratic shock, okay? Idiosyncratic risk, aggregate risk, all right? So you're subject to um, capital adjustment costs. I'm going to focus on uh, stationary equilibrium, where all prices can grow uh, at the same rate. Basically, we're going to adjust everything by the aggregate. So the adjustment cost in capital, the net wealth is not the wrong state. Capital and wealth are the two different states. Yeah, but you can, you can, OK. You can, Capital, you can reallocate capital among different entrepreneurs. So you have like a market for capital. You can buy or sell additional capital every period. So then you can 
instantaneously adjust. Right now, you can buy some. You can. That's what it's going to do. Is it's going to tie up. I can do that individual level. We can relocate capital among ourselves. Okay. But at the aggregate level, I can only get more or less capital depending on how much I do. So, and this is going to tie up the price of capital with uh, how much I invest. Okay? That's uh, actually, okay, fine. Uh, the, the, return, the return that I talked about before, that's mu r, is basically the dividend yield. So how much you produce, minus your labor cost, minus your investment cost, divided by how much you invested, plus your expected capital gain, how much this is thing is expected to appreciate over time. Okay? All right. This is your return. This is your objective function. So you're going to maximize some pretty standard utility plus some uh, bequest, uh, some utility you derive from important thing to notice is actually what matters for you is your notion of total wealth, is the financial wealth plus the present discounted value of your human wealth, uh, times a term that's going to be uh, age dependent. What I'm defining as the human wealth is going to present discounted value of expected labor income. Importantly, uh, uh, labor income is risky because wage is risky in this economy. So when you're going to compute that, you have to discount by a proper discount rate. You know, you shouldn't discount it by the riskless interest rate, who would introduce like a risk premium on that. I'm assuming there's only aggregate risk on this, so then um, you should adjust by, by the aggregate risk premium. Uh, and the third part that's going to be important for us is the fact that the effective risk aversion uh, varies over the life cycle. So if you look to the effective risk aversion of this age, it's going to depend on the human financial wealth ratio. Uh, it's going to be key to, to explain the cross-section facts. Uh, what about the decision of capital and aggregated idiosyncratic insurance? So at the end of the day, you get like a mean variance objective. So this is your mean expected, uh, expected return. This is your variance, uh, aggregate idiosyncratic variance times your effective risk conversion. Okay? Uh, this is the result of, of, of the continuous time formulation. It gives you this clean uh, portfolio problem. That's basically uh, gives a lot of tractability when you're you're solving this portfolio problem. What was this? Is this embedded in the previous problem? Yes, this is the this is a derivation of the HDB equation. So one way of writing the HDB equation is like this mean variance. So it's not an assumption; it's a result. If you want, so just like if you want to think about what's the decision of the portfolio choice of these these agents, think in terms of like a mean variance problem. You're you're okay. So it's, and interestingly, if you were, or probably to guess uh, like a mean variance objective, you probably would miss this. You probably would miss like this uh, time very effective uh, um, risk aversion. Okay. So, so here's the is basically the solution. Okay. Oh, importantly, this is subject to the scan the game constraint. Okay. And I'm gonna call the multiplier on that constraint uh, the shadow price of a idiosyncratic risk. And it's going to be an important object for us here. Okay, so this <laughs> PID is a Lagrange multiplier. It's not an actual price. Uh, it's going to be equal to a sharp ratio. So think of this as the excess return of an entrepreneur who would ensure uh, completely off aggregate risk and see what's left. So what's left and then is the return for the idiosyncratic risk. In the denominator, you have the part of the idiosyncratic risk that you cannot ensure. You have to keep yourself fraction phi of idiosyncratic risk. Okay, so this is how much risk you're actually bearing. This is how much of return you get uh, from the idiosyncratic risk. You can think that's an idiosyncratic sharp ratio. Okay, um, this is going to be equal to the to the Lagrange multiplier on on this candy game constraint. The limit for capital in this economy here. So how much are you, you're willing to invest on 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 your business here depends on this idiosyncratic uh, sharp ratio depends on how much risk uh, you're exposed to, how much idiosyncratic risk, and depends on your effective risk aversion. Okay? This term here is going to be the same for everyone. This here is going to vary over the life cycle. Different agents are going to have uh, different values for the human financial wealth ratio. This is going to mean different levels of effective risk aversion and different risk taking. Okay. Here's the consumption wealth ratio of, of these agents. 
So the first component is the MPC. It is increases with age. So this is a typical of uh, finite horizon models. As you come close to the final horizon, you have more and more incentive to uh, eat up your assets. Um, and if it, you have no uh, bequest motive at the last period, uh, this thing explodes basically with the whole stock of wealth in the last flow uh, second. Okay? It also depend on the on the financial wealth ratio. There is no bequest motive. There, there, there is, right? There's imperfect altruism. So what this, this parameter here uh, measures is exactly that. So if psi equals to one, then you have like no, um, no bequest motive, it's zero, uh, then this doesn't depend on age, so it replicates the full finish horizon case, okay? All right, so testing this, uh, so the idea is we're going to use this Townsend tie um, monthly What do you want to do now? What's the, the, the data? So the so first thing you're going to do now, I want to discipline the model. So we basically think of this as a calibration strategy, if you want. So how are we going to use the model? What do you want to use the model for? For uh, for the the impact of relaxing that phi. We want to know what happened in the economy when it provides insurance to these entrepreneurs. When it allow... What would that mean? What would that mean? So imagine that... Like, I know in the model what it means, but now what would it mean? It means that this, it basically means that these guys have more access to insurance. So that basically means in practice. Yeah. Okay. This, this, for instance, that's no different from what the... Uh, um, uh, Paco Boyer and others have did for microfinance, uh, for uh, microcredit. So what they did there is basically they have, they try to, to measure the aggregate impact of that and try to look what's the consequences of changing the parameter that means how much you can, you can borrow. Here we're going to change, what impact of change of parameter, how much you can insure. Okay, so you're going to use this data from, uh, from Thailand. It covers uh, 16 villages. Uh, for different uh, provinces, there are more than 700 households covering the 14-year period. Is there something in the data that allows you to look at that well? For example, large number of people hold loans, and the data that was in portfolios of these people. So that basically, what I'm going to show you is is how the, their portfolio varies over. Uh, the life cycle. Say, so, okay, different, you're going to say, oh, the young and the old, they do different things. So what is it that they hold? So, so basically, the way that I'm going to do it, I'm going to put everything into bins. So it's either cold. So, like, what is what they hold? Do they have bonds? Not much of like, uh, financial assets. They have some access to uh, some, like bank account or not directly bonds, but they have some saving account. Uh, they do have ex say, they have access to. Cash, you want to take all the cash that they have. You want to measure that. You want to call that the financial asset. Yeah. You want to get a measure of the land they own. You want to call that. You want to choose some kind of price. So, so basically, what this? Yeah. yeah what? The logic of what yeah. Exactly. So the, what? What? The, what? The, what the survey does is exactly try to measure all these things. Try to measure the value of your uh, physical assets. Or like you have like this. Uh, what is the aggregate rate of the sample of those? That's what you're trying to What? What's the aggregate rate of you normalize income to be one? What is the wealth and, and how do you hold it in terms of, of using credit? So, I'm going to show you in two slides. Is that okay? Like, uh, so, let me just show, let me just, uh, what I do first is just basically explain what we talked about before. So, how you measure this aggregate and using credit part, and I'm going to show you the, the uh, the, the allocations. So, so basically, how the way to measure this aggregated to syncretic premiums, so what you do is you first you try to measure how much exposure to aggregate risk you have. So you run a regression of the return on each business. So you have information on the income generated by each business. You have the information on the value of the business. So we have the measure of the return. You regress that on the average for the whole village. So we said, okay, I think that that's moving the whole village up and down, that's aggregate risk. So the beta on this uh, regression is gonna measure exposure to aggregate risk, okay? You can measure like the uh, average return on each 
uh, on each business. So take like a time series average return, it gives you the expected return. So in the second stage, you run a cross-sectional regression between expected return and the beta, so your exposure to aggregate risk, and your volatility, idiosyncratic volatility. So how much of the, the fraction of the variance to explain why it is idiosyncratic risk, okay? So then these uh, parameters here, uh, they're gonna be related to the premiums in uh, aggregate idiosyncratic risk. In particular, the coefficient on this term right here, so how much return is explained by idiosyncratic risk, it's gonna be related to that Lagrange multiplier that I talked about before. So that's basically how you can recover that from the data. So you can uh, use this sort of regressions to recover if you know phi, and we're gonna talk about identification phi later. Uh, if you know phi, you know uh, uh, this Lagrange multiplier, so that's we can, we can, we can test the model, okay? So another, another part of the story is to get the human wealth. So another part of the story is to get the financial human wealth ratio, and what we do is, First, we measure the labor income profile uh, for, uh, for this, this house, how this varies over the life cycle, and it seems like pretty standard, and you're gonna put some functional form of this uh, to, to input it in the model. Uh, this is gonna create some human financial wealth uh, ratio, okay? So this ratio is kind of a very important thinking about uh, how this allocation varies over uh, the life cycle, and see that it naturally declines over the life cycle. So here's the theta and here's the model. Uh, here's pretty much something about what we were asking before. So it's the share of wealth invested in business for these entrepreneurs, okay? So it's around like 30% of their total wealth is invested in this sort of risk. They, they what, sorry? So they own four times the value of the, of the land in the village, that sounds crazy. Yeah. They, they the same, the share of what in the business, which is land, mm -hmm. is a fourth, that means it's a very rich people. So they, they own four times more than the value of the land they live on. The point is that of their total wealth, yeah. that, like 32%. That's for the young guys, so now it is 25. So 25% of the value of the land, four times the value of the land that we own. These are very much equal according to the population. Yeah, that's what. They are, so there's not much wealth in Thailand, but it's four, four times. Sure, so, yeah, I'm sure you're getting like the. Farmers own four times the wealth. That sounds about. Yeah, so, so basically what this is saying is they, they don't. It's not everything that they have that's uh, allocated to this risky business. I don't say you, the f overall level of this, I forgot I didn't show you, but uh, they invest only like a quarter of it, yeah, on, on, on this. They own the land, don't they? Like, yeah. They represent the consumption, so they own all the land. Yeah, potentially, so yeah. what else is worth four times the value of land in the No, then the yep. denominator is the value of the, the house oh. they live in, you know? No, the value, yeah, there's that, there's that as well. So the value of the land they own would include, would be the denominator also. Yes. A big part of it, this is just a garage where they are running, they are running the business or something. No? Yes. So if, if you're here, it's basically the value of the... Uh, the garage. Yeah. So it's basically what's, what's, what's capturing, it's capturing this decline in, uh, in the share of wealth invested in the... Uh, in the business, this is coming from this decline in financial wealth ratio. Notice that this, how much is declined is entirely determined by this uh, financial wealth ratio. That uh, was computed entirely independent of the data of how much of your actual investing. This is the consumption wealth ratio, so this uh, uh, is about the savings decision of this agent. It has this U-shaped uh, pattern. And you see the declines initially of the life cycle. This is because the human financial wealth ratio is declining. Eventually it increases because the MPC is increasing over, over the life cycle. So for uh, later in life, this, this is the fact that dominates. you look at this you only look at So, yes. So basically, uh, uh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah, probably they're, they're talking about like this one. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, it could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, the cows are, are the assets. I'm trying to help you here. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're supposed to say, no, the shop is separate and the cows are not in there. Right? If the cows are in there, you're, you're moving me over. Okay. Yeah. If you're looking at the entire sample, if you look at only the entrepreneurs, it looks like really small. Okay, yeah. What else does the survey ask about? They go through the. Yeah, they go over a lot. Terrible goods in the house, the television. Yes, so they, they have like a lot of. Uh, the bicycle, all that's part of their wealth. Yeah. So we know a lot about like the durable, no durable consumption, the, uh, the trends that these guys have, like there's a lot about the financial lives of these guys. Um, yeah, I don't know much more, what else to say here on, on, I think that part of it is, is, I'm trying to remember what exactly is on the, on the other part. So part of it is some land that you don't operate yourself, that's also like, uh, there's, there's here the, the share investment in the business, only the part that you're operating yourself is have some part of land that someone else is using. Uh, this also would, would, would appear as uh, uh, Human capital, that's part of the wealth? No. Yeah, I'm trying to help you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I think part of these questions is why reducing this model for this data stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. understand what a businessman in the U.S. and you understand what it means to have bonds in the U.S. Mm -hmm. that. Like biologists, they do an experiment with a certain fly. Mm -hmm. We use the U.S. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's difficult to understand it because the, you know when Rob started working with these data sets, mm -hmm. he was interested in showing that there were informal consumption sharing arrangement. And yeah. We all understood then that this data set was useful for that issue more than the US. Mm -hmm. But for this model, yep. why, yeah, why, why do you want this data set first? And second, yeah, you need to really clarify each item what it means. Okay. We, we don't know what, what investment yeah, I think, I think at the end, what's, what this is trying to get is an environment where you have a lot of risk. That's something that we have in Thailand. And it's an environment where these guys uh, don't have the other instruments to uh, insure themselves. It's also like that seems to be true there. Uh, the, a lot of this is an um, environment where we have the informal markets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, if I think in the life cycle is not accumulating assets because I want to give them as a big price. So, my wealth is increasing over time. The wealth that I invest in my own business has increasing returns to scale because my labor is limited. So, even if it were at risk less, it would have that shape. As soon as I'm increasing my, my amount of wealth, the increasing return, I have to go outside to allocate. But you can hire you can hire labor here, right? So, so at the end, of what's happening is at the aggregate, the capital labor ratio is constant uh, in this economy. So the expected return is constant; it doesn't vary uh, over the life cycle. So it's not about like the return. So the reason why this is varying is not because the return is varying and how like the Queen's returns and how uh, the fixed supply of labor. So none of that is giving me like the time varying return. So what's happening is not the return is varying, it's like your factor of risk aversion is varying. So that's, that's what's changing. So, but expected return doesn't vary that much over the, over the life cycle. So, so let me show you, let me just show you a, a little bit of the, the, the wealth and equality results and then we jump to, uh, to the counterfactual. So 
what we can show is first what happened with the wealth across different age groups. So basically, this would depend on your human financial wealth ratio. I mean, you look at the human financial ratio is decreasing. A lot of this human wealth has been converted to financial wealth. It's going to increase uh, your wealth over the life cycle. So if your excess return increases over, as possible, over the, the growth rate of the economy or the average entrepreneur here, so it also tends to pull wealth up with age. But then PC tends to increase with age. So it tends to save a lot and less uh, for uh, later ages. So then it tends to pull it down. So basically what we see is you tend to accumulate wealth over the life cycle and eventually this uh, in fact brings it down. So that's uh, the data in the model. Uh, the model again, so it captures like the main, the main features and, and, and perhaps now not all the, all the, of the increase. So we also look to what happened to the within group inequality. So what happened in, if you fix an age group, how much dispersion there is in, uh, in there. So basically, uh, basically what happened there is we can solve the, you can solve the Komaro 4 equation for this, for this problem. So this is a special case. And the main prediction is this one. So this is from the data, but the model delivers that, that you have, um, uh, inverted U-shaped behavior of inequality. Inequality tends to increase over the life cycle and then declines uh, over later ages. Okay, and just to finish, <laughs> let me just show you what happened when you change this parameter phi. So when you change the parameter phi, basically what happened is if you reduce how much risk does, uh, these entrepreneurs have to bear, so this is going to reduce the price of the syncretic risk. So the syncretic risk will tend to decline. So the required rate of return the business goes down, that means that you, uh, uh, you can invest more. So this increases uh, um, in capital in this, in, in this economy. The, the return on, on the entrepreneur goes down, so the, the entrepreneur's share of total wealth in the long run tends to decline. Okay? So this tends to reduce uh, um, their wealth share, and to, to finish, their, this is what happened with inequality. So there's not a lot of variation in the between group inequality. So the, from bequest, you're gonna parameterize the bequestive motive by this theta. If theta equals to one, there's no bequest motive. If theta equals to zero, essentially I'm gonna see this. So, let me ask, so the state sure. vector is aggregate capital what is the state of this economy? Okay. So you're going to be, it's going to be, going to determine equilibrium, you're going to need the capital and you're going to need the whole distribution of, of wealth. Just, I think, consistent with what they understood. So just, uh, this adjustment cost of cash will determine the aggregate. From a little point of view, it's equal. Yes. Yes. That's what you have to do. That's the whole point of the zero net return in Thailand. So Thailand, I think of Thailand as, as separated from the rest of the world. It's a little island of Thailand where the bond prices are endogenous. That's what you want me to think of that. You can think that that if you want. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, paper. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the way that you're going to close it is you have some. Entrepreneurs are going to have some finance here they're going to introduce later on. That in equilibrium, this is going to be the two guys in the economy. The bonds. Two guys in the there's the whole, the entrepreneur, one, two types, to be more precise. Entrepreneurs, there's several entrepreneurs, different ages, uh, and the financiers. The financiers are going to be the guys on the other side of, of this market. So the one providing you know, the insurance, the one uh, providing the bonds, in case this guy is. <laughs> okay, I think perhaps we're going to see uh, if we see a little bit more if it becomes clearer. But uh, for now, I'm just talking about the problem of, of of entrepreneur. Okay, so take the prices as given for now. We can talk about determination in, uh, in a second. So this is the utility function for these guys. The cost of cost motive. T equals one. You don't give utility for next generation. T equals to zero. It's going to give uh, um, something that looks like an infinite horizon. Uh, agent, and like I mentioned, I have to choose um, uh, how much you invest. So this is the insurance, the skin, the game constraint that I mentioned 
uh, before, just how much your idiosyncratic risk is limited by uh, a fraction of what you invest. Okay? Uh, there's no boring constraints here. So in order to isolate the impact of insurance constraints, we're going to pose like a natural boring constraints. You can borrow as much as you want. Okay, actually, you're going to borrow as much as the present discounted value of your outside labor income. Okay, so this is basically the problem. So the problem is you're going to maximize uh, the utility of of entrepreneur born in the uh, date S, given this flow budget constraint, given the initial um, given the initial net worth, subject to this scheme game constraint. Okay. Uh, sorry. No, no, you're born uh, or an entrepreneur, you just choose how much you invest. You invest more, invest little, but there's no um, occupational choice. You abstract from that completely here. Okay? So let me characterize uh, the solution to the problem. So uh, how does the solution look like? So basically uh, what's going to happen is the investment rate in the labor demand so again, it's, it's, basic, it's basically what I mean is there's aggregate risk, right? So prices and, and capital, everything moves with the aggregate productivity, okay? But scale variables are going to be constant. So the wage divided by aggregate productivity is going to be constant. Uh, capital, by, uh, capital by labor is going to be constant. Yes. So basically, very narrow that we do all those silly box processes to have this problem. Yeah, basically, the, the, the whole idea is to have the stationary equilibrium such that you can analyze uh, that everything is yeah, constant. Like it doesn't happen, it doesn't have any, any lingering effects. So they still have the premium, right? So you still have an aggregate premium. Just, no, nothing. But the, yeah, but, the, but everything is going to move up and down with the aggregate productivity. That's the idea. Whole homogeneity of degree one idea. Okay? So that's what actually what makes this track when different from the, the IA guide setting is the fact that uh, you have this property, yes. Do you have any kind of like a misallocation such that the wage not only can be scaled by A, even some kind of misallocation also determine the wage rate? Not the wage rate. Uh, you can get some misallocation if you introduce some uh, heterogeneity on, on productivity, something like uh, the fixed effect that we were talking about before. Uh, would bring some misallocation of facts on the side of capital, right there. So here is like this financial constraint on this insurance uh, limitation does not cause any misallocation here? So no, because everything is, is, uh, uh, is the same. So basically what happens is you're, you're exposed to risk, so that's costly to you, but in terms of allocating uh, resources, basically all firms like look the same. So Yeah, and, and I think. Yeah, but that, but there's a reason for that. So like one one of the things that we were talking about before is the adjustment of the returns. And one interesting thing that look that happens in the Thai data is the following: uh, take this uh, risk-adjusted return. So take out like the aggregate idiosyncratic premium. So if you look to the correlation between wealth and returns, before you do that you find that poor entrepreneurs tend to have high returns. Okay? So pretty much in, in, in line with what we would expect from boring constraints. After you adjust for risk, actually you don't find that. If anything, you find the opposite. You find that like, the poor entrepreneurs have like, lower risk adjusted returns. So this causes to make like, okay, but perhaps, at least in the case in, in, in Thailand, uh, this uh, friction tends to be less important than the one related to risk. So, because if you borrowing constraints are really so that important, and again, this guy is really saving out of the constraint, uh, you should be seeing like these guys with uh, lower returns having higher uh, risk adjusted re uh, returns. Okay? So, on the labor part, the capital labor ratio here is going to be equalized. Everyone's going to have the same capital labor ratio, everyone's going to have like, the same uh, investment rate, they're going to depend on the Q, so like Q theory. Uh, typologic, and the expected return uh, is basically going to be equalized. 
Okay? The expected return will be real equalized. The actual exposed return uh, depends on the, your idiosyncratic shock, can be different, but expected return is going to be equalized. One way to get a misallocation here would be to introduce some difference in productivities across entrepreneurs. Then you can get the misallocation effects here. But abstracting from that, you can get pretty far even without that. Okay? So, what? Permanent ones. Imagine we have like permanent uh, fixed effects. Uh, different in productivity that would create a misallocation of facts. So our average wealth share or each age group doesn't vary that much. But the substantial decline in what happened in the within the group inequality. So basically just critical risk premium has sharp implications for what happened to, to inequality. And this is basically what happened in the long run. So uh, one thing they're working on is if you look to what ha to happen in transition, the transition is if you, in the short run, inequality tends to increase in this type of environment, and then it slowly uh, comes down. So it's kind of like cousin the type of dynamics of natural up here. Here, so you'd see inequality necessarily shooting up um, and eventually going down. So that's basically what we're seeing here. In the long run, uh, this inequality tends to go down. All right. No, no, and, and, and uh, basically because uh, the returns on their, on their, So th that's the point, right? So basically, return, mm -hmm. returns are going down. So that depends on who you're talking about, right? So the future generations. For another way to think of it is like future generations may be worse off because, yeah. yeah. So that's a bit, pretty much a thing of what we're, we're, we're taking at. Yeah. Yes. No, no. no, yeah, that's, I, I didn't have the time. I didn't have the time, but this is phi. This is, this is exactly the change in phi. The phi, that's the risk of insurance. The insurance, how much, the risk is sigma, how much variance you actually have. Can you show us the sigma of phi? We're sure, I'll show you both, but, but then the, with the insurance constraint says that phi is the thing that's between zero and one, okay? So the sigma can be whatever, uh, because we're measuring the data. The phi is the fraction of idiosyncratic risk that you have to bear yourself. You, you can insure one minus phi. 